Welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I'm glad you're joining us and welcome back if you're returning. So we're going through our EKG coding reference guide and we are now here in part six. And in this lecture, we're going to look at acute posterior MI. Okay, and the findings we could expect uh, to see with it, okay, because some are interesting. Uh, so if you don't have access to our reference guide, all you have to do is put this link into your search bar. Uh, and then you'll come to this page, enter your email address, click submit. From there, you'll get an email, and that email will direct you to a link with access, free access to the reference guide, okay? And you can have that available on the go. Um, now, if you want access to our lectures that are outside of this, obviously there's probably over 400 on YouTube, but we have a separate course that we use for our teaching our students, and it's www.ekg.md is our site. And from there, you can go and check out our course, our books, and everything that's separate from what we've made available online. So check that out if you're interested. And if you also want to go back and listen to our lectures, we've gone through part one, part two, three, uh, four, and five. And now we're getting close to finishing part six here. Okay, so we're doing uh, making our way through here. And so if you want to go back and listen to those, go, go ahead and feel free to do that. Well, let's get started here. So acute or age recent or probably acute posterior MI, what does that mean? So we're looking something that's in the acute setting, okay? So meaning that one, we may have to actually intervene on in the posterior MI. So how are we going to identify this? Well, there's a few things you should note here. First off, there are no posterior leads on the standard 12 lead EKG, okay? So no posterior leads, but the posterior leads that we can sometimes put on are V7 through V9, and it's a continuation of the precordial leads V1 through V6. So as you can see, here's V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, okay? Now what's helpful is we almost, because we don't have the standard uh, leads giving us a posterior view of the heart, we do have the opposite changes, so a mirror image of what we would expect, okay? And those would be in those uh, early precordial leads, so V1, and V2, and even up until V3, okay? So mainly these leads are pretty much on the anterior portion. So you can imagine them V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 as we go around, V7, V8, and V9 of the posterior, the back, okay? So imagine the front of the chest and the anterior portion and the posterior portion, okay? And so the opposite of these posterior leads are pretty much these leads. And why that's helpful is because when we're looking for a STEMI involving the posterior aspect, we almost want to look at these leads, okay? So instead of seeing ST elevation, which we would in the evidence uh, of a posterior MI, if we put those posterior leads, instead we're looking for the opposite changes in ST depression in those leads. If you look at the EKG here, in V1, there's not really much ST depression at all but if you look at v2 it's clearly there you have pretty much if you reversed it almost an upsloping st depression here's a flat st segment depression there okay and notice that you have these r waves occurring there okay and yes you may say these are normal r waves and maybe the one in v3 is normal as you have the r wave progression but if you have r waves that are deep think of those big r waves as almost q waves okay so imagine you have q waves and st elevation the opposite of a q wave would be an r wave in st segment depression okay and so the findings that you may see are an initial r wave with a 40 millisecond width, okay, in an R to S ratio that is greater than one in V1 and V2, okay, and we don't see these findings here, but I want you to be aware of them because it's not always the case, but it's something you should look for. So let, let me just explain what that is here, okay. So in V1 or to V2, these findings that you want is this R to S ratio of greater than one, okay, meaning that if you have an R wave, Okay, imagine this is your R wave and S wave. It's about a one-to-one -one ratio here, meaning the amplitude of these is about the same. When it's greater than one, what you would have instead is a R wave like this and something like that. So a big R wave compared to a smaller S wave amplitude, okay, greater than one. Uh, 
Now, aside from that, if we just erase this portion here, so let's draw that again, big R wave. Here's our S wave. Now imagine this S wave, and then you also have some depression here, okay? So you have almost the opposite. Imagine if you had the posterior leads, maybe you would see something like this, a big Q wave, and then something like that, okay? Where you have ST segment elevation here, and you have this Q wave here. The opposite is this big R wave, in the ST segment depression. So this would be the ST elevation. So you may see this in V7 through V9, those posterior leads over that region, but maybe in V1 to V2, you may see the opposite, okay? And the other thing is you may also see a concordant uh, T wave, okay, in the absence of a conduction defect. So we won't get into all that here, but hopefully that makes sense. The other thing is acute posterior injury suggested by ST depression, as we mentioned, uh, of at least one to two millimeters in those right precordial leads we mentioned. Okay, and again, because we said the standard 12 lead um, does not have leads, so there's no leads that overlie the posterior region, there's no ST elevation to suggest it, okay? Instead, the precordial leads V1 and V2 serve as the mirror image, where we wanna see the tall R waves, as we mentioned, as these are equivalent to those posterior Q waves in the ST depression, these leads equivalent to the ST elevation or posterior injury pattern. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense there. So you almost have to get this indirectly. You're looking at those right precordial leads and ST depression in those leads, okay? Now, what's another clue? And there's a huge clue that you probably like, what is all this here? Elevation here, right? So you have ST elevation, you have a Q wave that's there, maybe Q wave there and here, okay, slowly forming. And then you also have this ST depression in these leads. ST depression, pretty much, again, reciprocal changes of those in the inferior leads. And so why is that? Well, one thing you have to know is that inferior MIs are often associated with posterior MIs, okay? And that's why I put this image up here of the heart, okay? So why is that the case? Well, imagine, first of all, let's review the anatomy. Here's your aorta that gives off your uh, arteries. Here's the left coronary artery, okay? And then from your left coronary artery, you have the left circumflex, okay? Going around the left lateral portion and the left anterior descending coming over that anterior portion of the heart. Now to the right side, you have this right coronary artery, okay? And the right coronary artery supplies the right side, that right ventricle, and what it may also supply is a, uh, a artery down here called the posterior descending artery, okay? Now that posterior descending artery, because it's coming from the right side, is seen in a right dominant individuals, okay, which make up probably greater than 70% of the cases of individuals with this type of anatomy. Now, you also may have a co-dominant, and what that means, and so what dominance is based off is based on what is supplying this posterior descending artery. Is it this left circumflex, which we would call a left dominant, or is it the right coronary artery, where we call it a right dominant, okay? In this case, it's a right dominant, it's the most common, left dominant, about 10%, and co-dominant is when both vessels are supplying it. So you imagine them both coming to supply that in the back. Now note here, this one is supplied by the right and the PDA, or the posterior descending artery, supplies the posterior portion of the heart, okay? So if you have a posterior MI, it may involve the posterior descending artery. Now notice, if you have a blockage here in the proximal RCA, or right coronary artery, not only will it affect the inferior portion of the heart, but also the posterior. And that's why you may see the inferior and posterior walls involved in a big MI, okay, involving maybe the proximal RCA. So this is what we call a posterior inferior MI, okay, so you have involvement of both of them, and that's what this patient actually had. So a blockage of a proximal RCA affecting the inferior leads, that's why you see these inferior uh, changes, okay. So an inferior which is an acute MI in this one, as well as the posterior that was also acute, 
Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So we call this um, infraposterior MI, okay, because you have involvement of the inferior portion of the heart as well as the posterior portion, okay? So it's important to know your anatomy. Obviously, in our course, we go into much more detail on how to identify, how do you localize where in the heart a lesion is taking place. And again, that's not a perfect science, but it can help the interventionalist that's going in to know where to maybe uh, initially stent or look for an occlusion, okay? Especially in that acute setting. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, posterior MI, we don't have any posterior leads. So we're looking at those right precordial leads to give us an idea of what's going on in them. So V1 and V2 tend to have it. You see it certainly in V2 here and even V3. Remember, these chest leads are placed by people and people make errors. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there was an error here with these leads placed and maybe that's why we're not seeing that. But anyways, we see uh, ST depression in V2 and slightly here in V3 as well, and maybe even in V4 and V5. But this patient did have a proximal RCA occlusion that affected the inferior portion of the heart and the posterior. Okay, so again, remember those posterior MI changes, you're looking for the opposite. We have that increased R to S ratio in the right precordial leads, as well as um, those big R waves that represent the Q waves in the posterior portion and ST depression that makes it more of that acute posterior injury pattern. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Obviously, you can always add on V7 through V9 to get a good look at what's going on there. And in that case, you may see Q waves and ST segment elevation in those leads. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay? So this is our website. And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute. And this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100 more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay? And then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide. Uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there, okay? We'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already, okay? So this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use, uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, 
okay, why we developed this, okay, a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay? You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay? And you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.